Hi again, everybody. Chris Tisdale here. Thank you for joining me today. In this video, I wanted to share some recent research between myself and uh, one of my um, former PhD students, Sala. And um, the research is about connecting uh, fixed point theory with the equations from uh, laminar flow and porous flow and fluid flow. So I, I hope you really enjoy it. I also gave a similar talk at the ANZIAM conference uh, last year. So let me share my um, my screen with you and we can have a look at what's going on. So if I blow that up, I'll just... Yep. So the, the title of the talk is Laminar Flow in Channels with porous walls towards a more complete theory via contraction methods. And this is joint work with, with Sala, my former PhD student. So before I go through the, the slide deck, the, the actual paper is here. So it's been published and um, it's in the Journal of Fixed Point Theory and Applications. So if uh, I'll put the link at the in the description of this on this video, so you can also sort of go through here and it's all open access. All right. So what I'm going to do is just give you a brief, a brief introduction here. All right. So the idea, the purpose of the research is to develop a more complete theory regarding solutions to the problem of laminar flow in channels where there's uh, porous walls presence, present. And um, one of the, the innovative things that we do in this research is that we use the idea of a contractive map um, to, to help us understand um, uh, the solutions uh, and, and the theory. Now, um, these problems from um, laminar flow and, and porous flow have been looked at since about the 1950s, but the techniques mostly rely on perturbation techniques, asymptotics, numerical approaches, and, and shooting methods. There really hasn't been um, any papers that link the idea of a contractive map uh, and fixed point theory with with these problems. So, so that's one of the nice innovations, I think. Um, you're kind of bringing two worlds together. All right, so here's a rough hand-drawn by me diagram um, that, that, that's, to, uh, that's hopefully illustrating some of the physical properties. So you've got this channel, here's a wall and here's a wall. You've got flow going down the channel. And um, you've also got the, the the say the top wall and the bottom wall are being porous so so the fluid can flow through these walls so here you can see the um the fluid is kind of coming down and then parts of it are exiting through the wall okay so this would be called um, a suction case at the wall and you can have these these arrows reversed and you can have injection um and uh, at the at both walls the the rate of suction or injection is, is just constant okay um and, and so the, so the question is what how can we understand the velocity um of this fluid okay you can see the um the width of the channel is is 2h where h is some positive number um these are our um uh, uh, axes right um and um what we're going to do is really just concentrate on one or half of these of, of, of the area here. So you have this symmetry between this part and this part. So you'd expect um, the, the, the flow to go down here and then sort of out here. And then another line would go down there. And then there would be symmetry down the bottom here. So you'd go out like that, go out like that, go out like that, and go out like that. So really to understand the situation, you just have to look at half of the area all right okay and there's a change of variable involved and a rescaling and stuff that's why there's sort of two sets of axes here all right so we make a, a few assumptions we've got steady viscous incompressible laminar flow it's a 2d channel with porous walls as i mentioned earlier uh, suction or injection occurs through the walls at a constant speed now i'm not going to derive the problem uh, but I can say a few words about it. If you want the derivation, you can look at my pa or our paper or, or someone else's paper. The derivation is not new. 
Um, but it involves Navier-Stokes equations, continuity equations, some, some boundary conditions. And um, um, the, the important thing for, for this particular presentation is that um, Berman, back in the 50s, introduced this stream function of this form, okay? And um, basically what we're going to do is relate this uh, this stream function and this f to a differential equation and some boundary conditions. Okay, and so by determining this f, we're actually determining this stream function, and then you can go back and get the um, the velocity components. Right. All right. So so this is this is all very. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about this. You can look at look this up in the in the um, paper, but the, this is the differential equation that we get to, okay? And here is the Reynolds number. So this, this calligraphic capital V is like the constant wall speed. H is half the width of the channel. Um, and this has got to do with the, the viscosity of the fluid, right? It's a constant. So here's what's known as our Reynolds number. This is our fourth order nonlinear differential equation. And the, the f of the f is just this part of the stream function okay all right so here's our our problem it's a fourth order nonlinear differential equation it's highly nonlinear uh this r calligraphic r is called a reynolds number and then you have some associated boundary conditions and they can be linked back to um these problems uh, or these these conditions here for the um the velocity components okay so this is what we're going to work with this equation 1.1 subject to 1.2 all right so the idea um when we're trying to build a, a theory about say uh the solution the existence of solutions the uniqueness of solutions and uh the approximation of solutions um one of the 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 methods here is to use fixed point theory. And so we're going to use a famous fixed point theorem called Banach's fixed point theorem, also known as the contractive mapping theorem. And, and it's a great theorem because it gives you existence, it gives of a solution, it gives you uniqueness of a solution, there's only one, and it gives you a way of approximating the, the solution. It also gives a location for the solution. So it's an amazing an amazing um, fixed point theorem. And it hasn't been done within this context yet. Okay, so the first, um, uh, yeah, okay, so let's talk about methods a bit more. All right, so so these are the, 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 the questions that using contractive maps can answer. So we can ensure the existence of solutions to this problem. We can guarantee the uniqueness. We can get a computational approximation and, and a location. All right, so this theorem 4.3 is the main theorem that we're going to use. It's called Banach's fixed point theorem or the contractive mapping theorem, okay? So you've got a, a non-empty set and D, uh, a way of measuring distance between elements of this set, okay? Now this pair is known as a, a is, is assumed to form a complete metric space, right? Now, if the mapping, uh, there's a mapping T that is an invariant, so it maps X back into itself and it satisfies this contraction condition where alpha is some sort of um, positive constant between zero and one. Then the conclusion is that there's a unique uh, member of this set X that is invariant under, under this operator T. So T of Z equals Z. Furthermore, um, there's also a sequential approximation for any starting point in, in this set. You define the sequence recursively and this sequence will converge to the unique solution. So that is an amazing, an amazing theorem in my, in my opinion, because the assumptions are pretty weak and there's lots of interesting conclusions. So how does this work with this kind of problem? Well, I'm glad you asked. And the main idea is to um, rewrite this problem as an integral equation. And then this, op this um, operator T will be an integral 
um, operators. All right, so, so here it is, the first um, theorem. So the boundary value problem 1.1, 1.2 is equivalent to the following integral equation. So basically, um, if F solves this, then it solves the uh, equation 1.1, 1.2. And if, if F solves 1.1, 1.2, then it solves 2.9. Okay, this G is a Green's function. And the, the phi is an interesting one. That's actually a solution to this problem when the Reynolds number is zero. So when there's no uh, uh, suction or or um, or injection, the the phi here is a special function. It's kind of like a solution to the homogeneous problem. So if you set calligraphic R equals zero and solve this problem, you would get uh, you would get this function here. Great. So I, I won't prove that. Um, and then there's four important bounds on on this on the integral of the Green's function. So this is like the Green's function here. It's a piecewise defined function. And um, we're going to need some information about the Green's function. So, so Sala and I went through and we developed these bounds on the integrals involving the uh, the Green's functions. And some of them are sharp. So this is this is like the, the best bound possible. This is the best bound possible. These are not, these are more open, they're harder, um, but, but there's a whole bunch of stuff there. So we'll use that a bit later. In particular, we'll use that information with this condition and this condition, okay? All right, now um, you might be asking, well, Chris, what is, the X here, or it's a set, and what is the D here? Well, let's talk about that. We're talking about functions here and, and solutions. So what, what we're going to do, we're going to um, set up a space or a set that is the, uh, you know, three times continuously differentiable functions on zero, one, okay? And then this distance, this metric here, is going to be a way of measuring the distance between two two C three functions. Okay. Now we've um, introduced these constants. In in this way, they depend on the bounds on the Green's function. So beta naught is the bound on in here. Beta ones here. Beta twos here and beta threes here. Okay. So we sort of combine them because it it when when we apply this Banach fixed point theorem, these this way of setting it up is, is quite helpful and quite neat, okay? Now, this pair does form a complete metric space. And um, uh, what we're going to do is show that there is a solution to this problem 2.9, which is equivalently a solution to 1.1, 1.2. And we're gonna show that the graph of any uh, of, of this solution lies in this set, okay? Now I'll show you what that looks like a bit later. All right, so in order to um, uh, define our operator, what we, we take our Q from this right-hand side. So we say, we're saying, right, we wanna show that that equals that. Let's make this right-hand side T of F. And then if I can apply Banach's fixed point theorem, I know that T of F equals F. So it's the same as showing this equals this. All right, great. Last thing we need to do, what is our set X? Okay, well, um, X is gonna be a ball in C3 where um, the, the, the distance between any function in C3 and our um, homogeneous solution is less than or equal to R, where R is some positive number, okay? Now, because this is a closed subspace of this, it forms this thing, this subject to the, um, this metric forms a complete metric space. All right, so let's get to the result. There are many more results than this, but I just want to keep it uh, as light as I can, and I don't want to make this a long, uh, too long a video. But 
what you can do is you can show, right, what assumptions on R or calligraphic R, the Reynolds number, and this radius will lead to T being a contractive map, okay? So the, the, the first thing we want to do is show that T maps the, the ball back into itself, and then it's, it's a contractive map. What is this alpha, where alpha is between 0 and 1? Well, it's not too hard to do. Um, it turns out that if the Reynolds number is less than about two points, uh, 0 0.27, then we can get this holding and this holding, okay, for our particular operator T. Now, also, if that, like, when, when we do this, this R is pretty small, right? So basically the R would be here for this particular case would be, what is it, 0 0.07 around that, okay? And so what that means is if I draw a little strip with my homogeneous solution, right? What this theorem says is that, okay, if I have a small enough Reynolds number, then the solution, then my boundary value problem has a unique solution lying whose graph lies in in this little strip okay where this r is like about 0 0.07 okay and and so you you would kind of expect this because if i look at this differential equation here if r is small this uh, reynolds number if r if calligraphic r is small then you wouldn't expect the solution to deviate too much from the homogeneous solution, right? This solution here, when R, when calligraphic R equals zero, the Reynolds number equals zero. So the, the conclusion here kind of supports what we would hope for, what we would expect, okay? So what it says is that as long as the Reynolds number isn't too large, then the problem has a solution and we, we have some idea of uh, where the solution lies and it doesn't deviate too much from this homogeneous solution. Oh, all right, folks. I know that was quite um, quite difficult, quite high level. It, it is research mathematics, um, but uh, hopefully I've given you a taste for what it's about. Um, there are lots of lots more open problems um, regarding this, um, and this is just the first step. So we're working on um, other problems and uh, trying to uh, apply fixed point theory um, to those problems from porous um, uh, flows and, and fluid flows and laminar flows. Oh, all right, folks, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and uh, yeah, join me again. Bye.